On this Monday night, reaching for the stars. Your mission specialist, Jeremy Hansen. The first Canadian to be part of a new frontier, the revival of NASA's missions to the moon. Donald Trump travels to New York to turn himself in. What's next for the former U.S. president? Canadians enforcing sanctions on North Korea. We want to train as we fight so that we're prepared for anything. An inside look at their training mission preparing for intercepts in the sky. Canadians coerced evidence the Chinese government uses threats, intimidation and blackmail to pressure Chinese Canadians. And one-on-one -on -one with the Canadian astronaut headed to the moon. You'll be the only Canadian parent who can say to your kids, I love you to the moon and back and actually prove it. <laughs> what the lunar mission means to this father of three. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a first for Canada, the Ontario man who is going to the moon and back. His name is Jeremy Hansen. There he is on the right. He's been chosen as one of four crew members on Artemis II, the next mission to the moon. He's 47, raised on a farm, and he's a former fighter pilot who has trained for this for years. Now he's the only Canadian who is part of this elite group set to launch NASA's first crewed mission to the moon in more than 50 years. Joining him will be the first woman and the first African-American astronaut to go on a lunar mission. They won't land on the moon, that's still to come. This mission is a critical test. Mike Armstrong has our top story tonight. Your mission specialist, Jeremy Hansen. It's not a quality you associate with being an astronaut, but Jeremy Hansen's patience is paying off. It's been close to 14 years since Hansen was picked as an astronaut by the Canadian Space Agency. He's watched dozens and dozens of NASA colleagues go off on missions. Well, after all the waiting, he called this day glorious. We are going to the moon together. Let's go. Yeah. Artemis II will take the crew of four further than any humans have been in more than five decades. It will fly 400,000 kilometers to the moon, fly around it, and return to Earth. The trip will last about 10 days. Only Apollo astronauts between 1968 and 1972 have gone far enough out to see the entire Earth. And now a Canadian is going to be part of the very next people to see that, the first non-American to do it. It's a big deal. It's really important that astronauts are comfortable in a water environment. Hansen was raised on a farm outside London, Ontario, and says he doesn't remember ever not wanting to be an astronaut. He attended Royal Military College in Kingston, became a fighter pilot based in Cold Lake, Alberta. Bravo, one set. And eventually pursued his ultimate goal. And a clockwise three set. He's an exceptionally composed person. He's a good communicator. He's considered by many as a mentor to the new astronauts that have come in. So, I mean, this is, this is an incredible person. Now, the Artemis II mission will test the spacecraft for an eventual trip back and a landing on the moon. Well, Canada's seat on this next mission comes as part of a deal with NASA. Canada's contributing a lunar rover to explore the moon and a Canadarm3 that will help build a lunar outpost gateway. We'll be building a small space station that'll be in orbit around the moon where astronauts can live and work and prepare for future destinations. The plan is to eventually use the moon and gateway as a stepping stone on a trip to Mars. But there are other missions in the meantime. Canada has seats on two more missions to the International Space Station, and when it's built, a Canadian will eventually visit Gateway as well. Mike Armstrong, Global News, St. Hubert, Quebec. A little later, I'll talk to Jeremy Hansen about when he started dreaming about going to the moon and what he says about the importance of teamwork. Global News has uncovered evidence and examples of how the Chinese Communist Party is coercing some Chinese Canadians to spy on others in their community here in Canada. Victims say Chinese police treat their family members back in China as hostages, blackmailing them and threatening their safety. Jeff Semple reports. 
Whenever there's a protest in Ontario against the Chinese government's human rights abuses, his is a familiar face. Words are not enough, just it's time to take action as well. Mehmet Toti is a Uyghur Canadian. His mostly Muslim ethnic group is persecuted in China. He escaped the country three decades ago. Back in January, Toti was campaigning ahead of a vote by the federal government to accept 10,000 Uyghur refugees. And one morning, his phone rang. It was the Chinese police. Toti recorded the phone call and played it back for us. The Chinese police officer said he was calling with news about Toti's family in China. His mother and sisters, whom Toti hadn't heard from in a few years, were dead. His sisters were in their 40s. The officer claimed they died from strokes. The officer said Toti's uncle also suffered a stroke, but survived and was in hospital. Then they put his uncle on the phone. His uncle confirmed the other family members were dead. His voice is so weak, and it was a warning sign, basically giving me the message that if you continue and only the cousin you have could share the same fate, unless you stop. Here in Ottawa, Toti says he's been followed, his activities monitored by a network of spies. Erkin Kurban says Beijing tried to coerce him into spying. They thought they had recruited me, he says. The Montreal truck driver came to Canada from China 20 years ago. But in 2013, he went back for a visit. This is the last I visit my mother. To see his 85-year-old mother, who was sick. Once he arrived, he was summoned for questioning by Chinese police. The police officer took my Canadian passport, threw it on the floor, and stepped on it, Kurban says. Police knew Kurban had attended Uyghur rights protests in Canada. They said if he cooperated, they would treat him and his family well and allow him to see his mother. I asked them, what do you want from me? They said, you have to monitor and inform us on activities in Canada. He says police were particularly interested in several Canadian activists, including Mahmet Toti. They introduced me to my handler and said he would be in touch, he says. Within one week, I started receiving phone calls from him. I was angry. This Chinese Torontonian came to Canada in 2011. We're protecting his identity because he has family in China. Until recently, his wife and daughter were there too. He says they were visited by Chinese police and told to deliver a message. You get a message from your wife. Yeah. And they are asking you basically to, to spy on your own community. Yes. She was crying. The first time she was crying about that. Yeah. She, she felt so scared. He says the Chinese police threatened to repossess their house in China unless he spied on his Toronto landlord. Pro-democracy activist Sheng Shui. I was, I was very, very, very shocking. Because uh, when he lived downstairs, you know, we don't even have one door has lock. Shui strongly suspects she's been spied on by others in the community. For years, she says, she's reported harassment and surveillance to police and government officials with no result. I have been waiting for the government and the community and the media realize how, how bad the Chinese infantry in Canada. Kurban says he gave Chinese authorities false and irrelevant information, and after six months, they stopped calling. But he says many of his own community members now view him with suspicion. Anyone with family members still in China could potentially be coerced. Intimidation, threat, harassment, hijacking your family members, and pushing you to live under the Chinese shadow, even you are in free country. They're far from China but still in Beijing's sights. Jeff Semple, Global News, Ottawa. Tomorrow we'll hear first-hand accounts from people who say they've been targeted here in Canada for speaking yes. out against the Chinese government. In Calgary today, at least three people were stabbed in the city's downtown in the middle of the afternoon. Police say the suspect was tracked and arrested about 30 minutes after the attacks. The suspect is believed to be connected to the stabbings and a robbery. One of the victims was taken to hospital with what first responders are calling traumatic injuries. And in B.C., an attack on a man on a transit bus over the weekend is being treated as terrorism. Abdul Kawam was charged originally with attempted murder after allegedly slashing another man's throat on 
a bus in Surrey on Saturday. RCMP National Security Police took over the investigation after the suspect made what police call several concerning comments. Prosecutors have now added four counts of terrorism and allege the attacks were carried out for the so-called Islamic State. A second person was hurt in the incident. Both victims are recovering. In New York City, former President Donald Trump is back at Trump Tower tonight, expected to turn himself in tomorrow to be arraigned on criminal charges. It's related to a hush money payment made to an adult film star. Trump is the first former U.S. president in history to be charged with a crime. Jackson Prosco is in Manhattan tonight following developments. As Donald Trump left his Florida home, crowds of supporters lined the highway to the airport where the former president boarded his private jet and set off for a date with the justice system. Arriving in New York, he was whisked to his luxury penthouse at Trump Tower for a night overlooking a city on edge over what could happen. While there may be some rabble rousers thinking about coming to our city tomorrow, a message is clear and simple. Control yourselves. Trump supporters are vowing to protest 35,000 New York police officers are on standby. It's in Lower Manhattan where history will unfold Tuesday, where reporters from around the world have come to witness the first ever arraignment of a former American president. Hopefully this will be as, as painless and classy as possible for a situation like this. After he surrenders, Trump will be fingerprinted, photographed, and appear before a judge. But he's no ordinary defendant. He's already posting online attacks on New York's attorney general and the judge assigned to the case. Despite all the noise, um, there's no evidence uh, suggesting that this is a political prosecution. There's no evidence suggesting that there are other people who committed similar offenses that Manhattan prosecutors decided not to prosecute. Jackson, what are we expecting to see and hear from the arraignment tomorrow? Well, Donna, a lot of those details are still being worked out at the last minute here, including whether or not a camera might be allowed in the courtroom. It's former President Trump, though, who is at risk of not being able to say much. That's because of his ongoing comments about both the district attorney and the judge. There's real risk that he is slapped with some sort of gag order. And Donna, that would prevent him from discussing the trial unless he wants to face severe criminal penalties in the courts. All right, lots to come. Jackson Prosco in Manhattan tonight. Thanks. Enforcing North Korean sanctions. Coming up, the training mission preparing Canadian forces for possible intercepts in the sky. A team from the Canadian Armed Forces is preparing for deployment as part of a multinational effort to monitor sanctions on North Korea. Global News was given access to the training mission as the team prepares for potential intercepts in the sky. Neetu Garcha reports. Lieutenant Colonel Don Jamond is taking the next steps in preparing his crew for what they may face overseas. It's tailored to the mission that we're going to go do. Um, it's, uh, it's an important piece of uh, our preparation. It's important for all of our crews to do this training uh, before we go away on other exercises or operations uh, in which there's a chance on uh, air forces from around the world uh, may intercept us while we're away. Taking off from the base in Comox, B.C., the Canadian Armed Forces says exercises like this range from four to six hours off B.C.'s west coast. We're doing some uh, interception uh, practice, so just simulating that as if we were being intercepted by a fighter aircraft. The mission they're training for is Operation Neon, Canada's contribution to the monitoring of UN sanctions designed to deter North Korea from its weapons of mass destruction programs. Since recent operations, there's been, uh, there's been some intercepts like that. Uh, it's, uh, it's valuable training. In November, the Royal Canadian Air Force told Global News Chinese military jets intercepted one of its surveillance planes during a recent Operation Neon mission. This training preparing the crew for similar scenarios. Basically just uh, fly alongside uh, uh, our aircraft just to show us that they're defending their territory. This Aurora crew is actually communicating directly with the pilot in the intercepting Alpha jet, dictating its next move. We're basically just uh, talking to the, uh, to the jet pilot, just 
directing them to go through the different sets, uh, different types of uh, intercept from uh, different angles. Having the pilots know the position of the aircraft is very important and this is a great chance for us to practice that. A real intercept would be much less predictable. Overseas, uh, you know, we don't want anything to come as a big surprise. We want to train as we fight so that we're prepared for anything. It's not every day that we uh, get to see something like that, so this is pretty unique. While this level of training is new, the planes they're flying may soon be as well. As this crew was in the air last week, the federal government announced it's moved closer to a possible acquisition of Boeing Poseidon aircraft to replace these aging auroras. Neetu Garcha, Global News. Beijing balloon ahead. New reports on what the Chinese object was up to while in North American airspace. There are reports that Chinese spy balloon, which flew through Canada and into the United States in February, gathered intelligence from sensitive American military sites and was able to transmit information back to Beijing. NBC News, quoting senior U.S. officials, reports the high-altitude balloon passed over some sites multiple times and was capable of beaming back information in real time. It's believed the intelligence came mostly from electronic signals, which can be picked up from weapon systems. At the time, the U.S. played down the impact on national security the balloon spent a week flying over the U.S. and Canada before it was shot down by American fighter jets off the Atlantic coast on President Joe Biden's orders. The U.S. has since recovered and analyzed debris and says intelligence collected has limited value. Beijing claims it was an airship that accidentally strayed off course, not a government spy balloon. A Lebanese-Canadian academic went on trial in absentia in France today. Hassan Diab is facing charges related to a bombing outside a Paris synagogue over 40 years ago. Diab is a lone suspect in the attack, which killed four people and wounded dozens. He's accused of planting a bomb in October of 1980 outside the synagogue, where 320 worshippers had gathered. Canada authorized Diab's extradition to France in 2014. He spent three years in prison but was free due to a lack of evidence and returned to Canada. The French Court of Appeal later ruled he must stand trial. The 69-year-old denies any involvement in the attack. Next, Canada's Jeremy Hansen talks to me about how a treehouse and teamwork prepared him for his upcoming mission to the moon. A Canadian is going to the moon with our international partnership, and it is glorious. Well, you don't get picked for a job like that unless you've trained for years and are at the top of your game. Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen is. He is part of the Artemis II crew that will fly around the moon next year, the first Canadian to ever do so. Jeremy Hansen joins me now from Houston. Jeremy, what a treat to speak with you. Uh, you know, I know part of the job requirement is to remain cool, calm, and collected at all times, but how are you feeling today? <laughs> yeah, maybe not completely calm or collected. Uh, pretty extraordinary day for myself as a Canadian, for my family, but uh, most importantly, I hope for Canadians, I really hope they feel the pride that I felt today standing with uh, my American colleagues, setting this big goal of going back to the moon, this goal of, around collaboration. It's very meaningful for me. It was very meaningful to see our partners uh, highlight Canada and really uh, lift us up and highlight what our amazing country has done uh, to put us in this position to send a human around the moon. Jeremy, I grew up on a farm like you, and I remember often looking up at the moon, especially on summer nights, in wonder, but never thinking I was going to go there. Did you have that dream as a kid? I did. I, uh, I was really interested in aviation, and I was thumbing through Encyclopedia A and I, for airplanes, and I came across uh, Neil Armstrong, and I saw a picture of a human standing on the moon. I was young, and it made it, I can still see the image of that page burnt in my mind. It really made an impression on me. I never looked at the moon the same way. Uh, right away, I turned my tree house into a rocket ship. I had <laughs> gauges and dials and circuit breakers for switches, whatever I could find around the farm, and I was exploring space. And I just didn't know that that would be a long shot. People told me that it was possible. I was pretty lucky to be lifted up and mentored along the way. That's terrific. I know you trained as a fighter pilot. You graduated from astronaut candidate training in 2011. You're the first Canadian to lead NASA's astronaut training program. What part of that vast amount of work that you've done over the years has best prepared you for this mission? 
Oh, I think it's the diversity of all those skills, but probably the most important one, and we talk about it a lot in the core, I talk about it with youth, it's really important, is um, teamwork. It's got to be teamwork. You know, you don't go to space alone, and you have to be very, very intentional about just continuing to evolve yourself with respect to how you communicate with others, how you lift others up, how you support them, having empathy. This actually turns out to be more important for how much you can get done, even more important than the, than the technical. That's interesting. Why does this test mission to fly around the moon matter so much? Well, you know, Artemis II mission is, you know, a next step to sending humanity back to the moon in a sustainable way, going there to stay, um, learning more about the moon, preparing us to go on to Mars. So this is just one more step. Um, so it, it matters. It's important because it sets us up for the success of the future. But more important for for me, the way I look at this, this is a tremendous symbol for Canadians, for them to just look and realize, wow, we can do incredible things when we set big goals and we yeah. collaborate globally. Um, sometimes I think as Canadians, we, we keep ourselves a little bit small. And I've traveled all across our country. I've seen our space industry, talk to our scientists, our engineers, our youth. I see it. We're brilliant. And uh, right now we're being lifted up and, and showcased that uh, we bring real value to the globe. And I love that. That, I think, for me, will be the most important story of Artemis II. Jeremy, it struck me today that you'll be the only Canadian parent who can say to your kids, I love you to the moon and back and actually prove it. <laughs> yes, I know. I've thought that before. And I used to say that uh, a lot. It's on the wall of my uh, daughter's bedroom. And uh, so you're right, it'll be very meaningful for us as a family. Oh, terrific. Thank you so much, Jeremy Hansen. Yeah, thank you. What an accomplished, thoughtful and down-to-earth guy. That is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. A little shout-out to the town where Jeremy Hansen went to high school, Ingersoll, Ontario, is tonight's Your Canada. Please email Your Canada to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.